Welcome to the Zone Informer Podcast. I am your host, Alfred Tabex, joined again by Nathaniel Rumpel Jantz. Say hi. How's it going? So, we've got a bunch of uh, small snippets of some information about Breath of the Wild from an interview with IGN um, that they conducted with Aonuma and Miyamoto and some of the stuff that worked on the game. Um, so, we're going to talk some about that. Uh, talk about some of the three main facets for that, which were the NPCs and then the companions. But then we're also going to talk about uh, another little secret that was revealed in a Famitsu scan um, and what that could mean for the game's timeline placement and a little bit more on that later. And then um, we're going to talk about our experiences playing Breath of the Wild. Um, since both of us have played it now and I've played it on the Switch, we're going to kind of talk about how that worked, um, what we liked about it, what we didn't like about it, and uh, where we think that the or what that we think the game's strong suits are and stuff like that. Um, but that'll come at the, towards the end of the show, so stick around for that. Um, but right now we're going to get into the news. So, like I said, we're going to start off with the NPCs because we learned a lot about that. Um, I'm going to read some of the things that Aonuma said that we have posted on our website. Um, and we'll just kind of talk about what we think about that. Um, so one of the first ones <clears throat> that I have up is that uh, Breath of the Wild's NPCs are going to reward Link for helping them in battle. Um, it says, so this is a world filled with, this is Aonuma, this is a world filled with monsters, so Link can't be the only one who's battling to take them down. There are people along the way who will, Link will ask for help, and if he helps them out, they will give him rewards like an item or such. Um, and this kind of reminds me of the system in Dying Light when you were just running throughout the city, or the, the country, and you would run into people on the streets, on rooftops, fighting off a zombie, and then you'd kill the zombie, then they'd reward you some way, um, to kind of make it more of like, okay, well, you're, you're not the only survivor in this place, and there are other people there. It's, it's more of a fluid world, which is what they're going for. Um, because then they talk about, uh, later on, uh, in this other one, uh, it says Miyamoto, it's, it's about him talking about how they programmed the NPCs and how they acted. Um, so first it starts off with Aonuma. It says, There are people who live in these worlds just as monsters are living in the world. These little details are something that I think everyone will enjoy, so I really want you to pay attention to these fun details as well. And then Miyamoto added, Initially, when we were creating this game, there were scenes with tons of villages in one place or some of the villagers were wandering at night. It's so dangerous. Who would do that? Uh, Aonuma laughs. It detracted from the immersion, but as we worked on it, we reworked things that they each have their own lives. So um, there's a lot that we could speculate about that, but I'll get into that in a second. Um, <clears throat> and then finally, it says, there's just some more information on some of the NPC settlements. And Aonuma starting off saying, as you see in the trailer, there are lots of people who think Link can interact with, or who Link can interact with, and there are towns and villages. Above all, there are the stables, which we show during the Treehouse Live. Stables are where users can register the horses that they ride, but there's more to the stables. They serve as a crossroads where people can come and go, and you'll be able to meet new characters and exchange information. And then Miyamoto adds, All of this is seamless and everything is connected, so you can really understand where that village or that stable is in the world. Um, so, it's just kind of giving some information on that. But there's something that really stood out to me, at least, from this. Is it's when they're talking about how um, each villager has his or her own life. Um, <clears throat> and in a game this massive, <clears throat> I... I don't think that they're going to be as detailed as the characters in Majora's Mask. Uh, so we're not going to see, like, extremely long side quests that could be very well be a, a DLC pack for a Nintendo 64 game. But we'll still see each character have their own personality um, and have their own side quests, I guess, and, and in different ways that we'll see them act. Um, I thought it would be cool to have all the characters have their specific story that you had to follow out, and who knows? Um, this is speculation, that's all we can really do right now, because we don't know too, too much about the this aspect of the game. Um, in terms of NPCs, these are some that we've never seen in a Zelda game before, mm -hmm. um, so we can't really say for sure what they're going to be. We know that they've taken inspiration from Skyrim, we know they've taken inspiration from The Witcher, um, and from other Western RPGs, and... Um, in terms of how the world is and how the NPCs act. Uh, so we can kind of base some information off of that, but I really wouldn't use that and say, well, obviously they're going to be like they are in The Witcher. They're going to be like they are in Fallout. But what really stood out to you out of these, or for at least the NPCs, Nate? Uh, I think it's that they will be really heavily focused on the individuality of the characters. Um... 
you know, as you said, it's probably not going to be <clears> as in-depth <throat> as, obviously, Majora's Mask, which a lot of the depth around that game yeah. was based on the time system. So, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, there's day and night cycle and everything, but we haven't seen anything that says that it matters what day and night it is. Um, but, like, they made interesting comments how at one point during development, like, they had NPCs, like, they would just all wander out in the middle of the night, and that felt really weird. <laughs> um, so they're yeah. like, that, like all, all the NPCs shouldn't be doing that. Like, some might, but, like, every NPC in a village doesn't just wander out in the world. Um, so they, I kind of like that. It sounds like they're all going to be unique. Like, you're not going to find um, a copy of the same same face, the same person from one area to another. Uh, if it looks the exact same, it's because it is the same character. Um, and yeah. that these characters are going to have their own personalities of some type. Uh, we don't obviously know how in-depth they are. Certain characters will naturally be more in-depth. Um, you know, and that's crazy to think about. Yeah, it is. That, that, that they're doing It that. is, because that's, that's not what Zelda's done. Um, in Twilight Princess, you go to Castletown, 99% <clears throat> of the NPCs there, I'm just going to... I'm air quoting because most of the things there aren't really NPCs. They're just background noise. Um, <coughs> but that's the thing. They're just background noise. Uh, and mm -hmm. some of the individual NPCs you have, they don't really say anything. They don't really have much of a personality. They're just there. Uh, so, like, you could talk to them, but they say, like, one word, and that's it. And it's the same thing they say every time you talk to them. Um, so I'm curious uh, if part of the individuality is going to be that as things change in the game, they have different responses to things going on. Because if that's the case, that's what's going to make it feel like a dynamic and believable world and believe that these NPCs live in this world. Because um, from what we've seen... And that they're affected by yeah, it. Yeah, because yeah, from what we've seen, um, you know, you clear out enemy caps, you destroy stuff. Like, that stuff doesn't come back, at least from what I've seen. Mm -hmm. um, it, maybe it does over time respawn or something, but it doesn't seem to. And since it doesn't seem to... Uh, it would be really weird if a major, like you do a quest, like a side quest or something for a village, and a major change happens, but the villagers still react to you the same way. Uh, that just wouldn't make sense. Uh, so I, I'm very happy that they're doing this individual thing. Uh, obviously, you no, know, is as in depth as Skyrim, as in depth as The Witcher? We have no idea. Um, we mm -hmm. we don't think Nintendo has the capability. I don't think to to do that um, <laughs> because they yeah. they've never proven it. Like, but that's the thing. This Breath of the Wild is, at least from my experience, seems to be proving that they could do all the stuff that no one thought they could. Um, mm -hmm. at, at least personally, I didn't think that EG, like a Zelda game led by AG Aonomo, could be like Breath of the Wild. Um, you know, and, it, it, and so that that's kind of something to say. Like, like not the characters per se. Like he's always had like a little touch with some characters, um, but just the way this whole game is going just feels very unlike him. <coughs> Um. Well, and it seems like everything in this game is intentional, and it yes. matters. Um, like they're very big on like the it's a living, breathing world. Yeah. Like they've reiterated and it's, that. It can't be it can't be a living, breathing world if the NPCs are static. They have to yeah. be living and breathing with this world, and I think that's why they noted like, yeah, you'll see NPCs out there fighting, and you can help them or mm -hmm. you can not help them. It's kind of up to you. Um, and and that'd be interesting to see too. Like, what if? Like, can those NPCs die in a fight? Like, if, if you don't help them, if you're and if they do die, does yeah, that affect you don't what them. side quests you can get later? Um, yeah, and we don't know how in depth this is. I hope it's like that because then it means what you do matters. Because otherwise, mm -hmm. it's like, oh, if we leave them alone, do they just endlessly fight those bulk of lens for eternity <laughs> if I don't help? Um, so I, I'd like to believe that's not the case, but again, we have no idea uh, what's been put into it. All I know is that the fact they're emphasizing that they're proud of how the characters work, um, that means it's important to them. Which means they must be doing something mm -hmm. with these characters that we just haven't seen in Zelda before. Um, so I have a lot of hope that it's gonna, that the NPCs are going to feel as much a part of the world as enemies do. Because enemies always feel like they're part of the world, right? You know, you walk over and a stepped talus comes out of the ground, or, yeah. you know, the bulk of <clears throat> camps and all that stuff. Like, it all feels natural with the world, and the towns have kind of felt like their own thing. Um, well, yeah, like, even in Ocarina of Time, like, you'd be walking, and a pie hat would walk by, or, like, fly by, or a Stalfos, or a stall child would come out of the ground, and that was like, okay, like, the overworld has natural enemies, um, but whenever you got to a town or something, it was like, 
Okay, well, this place is completely void of any enemies right, whatsoever. Right. Like, like Kakariko Village in Ocarina of Time, it's like, there's no gate, there's nothing closing it off, why aren't enemies there? There's literally a gate right up Death Mountain, too. It's like, obviously these guards are really inept, so they're not gonna fight off all <laughs> these things. Um, <clears throat> so it's, it's good that they're making it flow naturally. And, and uh, one of the other things that you noted, too, was if the, it'd be interesting to see if the NPCs um, react to different things that you do, uh, whether you clear out a camp or... Um, you do a certain side quest, like in a, one of the things that uh, in Skyrim, uh, would, one of the very first things you can do is you can join one of the like one of the guilds mm -hmm. or factions, um, and so whenever or like a, if you join Stormguard or something like the characters will refer to you as having done that, or if you're a vampire or what have you, they'll they'll, they'll talk about it that way, um, and they'll refer to you based on that that decision or, or that uh, ripple effect mm -hmm. in the game. Um, and so it'd be interesting to see how Zelda handles that, how the, how the game as a whole handles that with the characters and the NPCs. Um, and one of the things that I thought was very interesting comes from the next, uh, interview or the next tidbit from the interview. Um, <clears throat> and there's, it's Aonuma talking about the characters in the trailers. Um, and we have a spoiler warning here in case <laughs> you don't want to be spoiled. Um, says, in the trailer, you probably saw some characters and wondered who they are. These are the companions who will help Link on his journey, and the support that you will see from these characters is not the usual kind. It's a bit more mysterious. And that is very vague, um, and I don't speak Japanese, and, but I speak Greek. And so I know that certain words that we translate into English may not have the same meaning. Um, and so when I think of companions in a game, I think of like the people that follow you around in like Fallout or uh, Skyrim. Um, but that may not be the word he used. Um, but that's the best way we could translate that. So I wouldn't necessarily take that right now as face value that we're going to have people following us around. But at the same time, he says, the support you see from these characters is not the usual kind. It's a bit more mysterious. Um, so we're left to wonder what that means. Um, I don't I don't know if I'd like to see these characters follow Link around. Um, I think it'd be interesting. Um, and uh, But I think at one point they talked about Link not having companion characters. Am I, am I right about that, Nate? Uh, yeah, not having like a guide character. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but these also wouldn't function as a guide. Mm -hmm. They'd be people well, the, following you around and that, fighting with you. That we know of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it's, it's all, like, again, speculation. Like, we're getting new information, and then we're just guessing on what it could mean. And again, like, especially with translations, that's one of the things you always have to be careful about, is, is, is the word that they're saying the word that we're getting in English? Are they the same thing? Mm -hmm. um, because... So most of the time when things get translated in English, they get weaker word choices. Um, <laughs> you find a word that's that has a stronger connotation in, in another language, most of the time, it's a weaker version in English. Um, it's just how we are. We're a weak, weak language. Um, <laughs> but yeah, wh what, do you, what are your hopes for this? Do you hope that they uh, follow Link around and that they're companions in the, in the sense of a, a Western ideal of a companion? Or more of someone that Link goes to for help? Um, neither. <laughs> uh, I, I mean, I, I like the idea that, you know, Link's not in this fight alone. Um, or that mm -hmm. he's not trying to save the world alone. And, you know, they made reference that, you know, the, the, the three characters wearing blue, which we saw in the trailer, are, like, mm -hmm. like really ma massive characters that help out Link. Um, I, I'd like to think that maybe it's one of those things where um, each one of those characters uh, helps out in a particular part of the game and then like can optionally help you out in other parts of the game if you want them to. Like Maybe you have the ability mm -hmm. to, through the Sheikah Slate, like, get a hold of them somehow um, mm -hmm. and ask for their help if you want it versus requiring that they have to be with you or... Um, you know, requiring that you have to do a certain thing. Because this game's all about options, right? It's all about choices. It's all about player freedom. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think even with these companion characters, because you know, as has been stated by AJ Noma several times, you can go to the end boss right away. Um, mm -hmm. It's obviously that these guys are optional in the first place, so you don't have to have them. But uh, 
obviously, if you are caring to play this game, you're probably not just going to skip right to the end boss. You're going to want to enjoy everything. So I, I feel like they just need to be, uh, you know, when he's something in a very mysterious way, uh, I know it doesn't tell us a whole lot, and that's the, that, that's the <laughs> purpose not to tell us, uh, except to say that they're important. So I, I just think, I, personally, I just want to see them as almost in uh, some of the roles that we've seen in the past, like with uh, Darunia, stuff like that, like where they're major figureheads for their race, but mm -hmm. instead of just being involved in like a singular area, they're involved with you throughout the whole game after you meet them, uh, as much as you want them to be involved. Like, uh, say after you, uh, say that, let, let's presume the airship is a dungeon as an example. Um, that once you conquer, you know, it becomes good or something. Um, well, it'd be cool if, like, that your bird companion guy kind of runs that ship now. And anytime you want to use that ship, you just kind of call upon him and he brings the ship to you. It's the Brotherhood of Feathers. Yeah, the Brotherhood of Feathers. <laughs> uh, so, like, ju just finding a way to... Uh, I, I guess I want it to be, like, organic and make sense. Um, and the thing is, like, if there is a point in this game where, like, there's some massive battle... Yeah, it'll be sweet if these guys are all joined you, joined with you, along mm -hmm. with other citizens, and like there's an actual battle, which people, you know, yeah, you can say you saw it in Hyrule Warriors. Come on, come on, Hyrule Warriors, that's not a real battle. Come on, <laughs> you know, Link's not swinging his sword and tearing down fifty guys with one swipe. You know, like in I mean, I don't know how much help they were, anyways, considering they were always in trouble yeah. in Hyrule Warriors. Always in trouble. You know, doing William Wallace legendary style. Um, <laughs> no, it, it's. I just want to see these characters um, be, I guess, almost as individualistic as they can. Um, I wouldn't even mind them saying, uh, like, if Link like calls upon them and they're like, dude, we can't. Sorry. Like, <laughs> we have some, this thing going on. And, like, you go and you're like, oh, I don't believe you, right? Like, I'm going to go. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to quick travel and I'm going to get over to, to where you supposedly are and make sure you're not lying to me. And then it turns out... Oh, they are doing what they said they were doing. And oh, maybe they could use some help so I can hurry them along. Um, or they do that a few times, and then one time he just says whatever, like the Falco guy says whatever, and you're like, oh, okay. And then you go check on him, and he found out he lied to you. <laughs> and maybe he lied to you because of a choice you made earlier in the game with him, where you chose not to bring him with when he wanted to come. Mm -hmm. um, so now you call upon him, and he's like, Psh. Well, I'm gonna make up an excuse because I don't want to be a dick, but I'm being a dick. Um, <laughs> so I, it's just I want to see a lot of personality, a lot of individuality, uh, because if these are gonna be major characters, I, you know, I, gruesome up, man. Like give them a lot of character to their to their abilities, and, and just mm -hmm. have it feel natural. Like it, it's really weird because I don't know what to expect because we've never had this before in Zelda. Mm -hmm. Like you know, I even think of you know Western games; they don't have this either. So I, 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 there's nothing for me to base my expectations on. Um, yeah, and we don't even know what any of them do. We just know they're important. <laughs> yeah. It's just, I imagine they have some like. Are they connected? To, I mean, they're. Uh, are they connected to the dungeon somehow? Or. Yeah, I mean, like they. We said in our article that they mentioned uh, the spoiler alert. Rito, um, the. Oh yeah. Goron and the Zora, but we also saw a Gerudo in there. Yeah. Um, that wasn't touched on. So maybe the four are like um, a water area, a fire area, um, and then a sky area, and then the desert. Um, and it would make sense based on what we know that some of these areas exist, like Death Mountain, um, and then maybe even, uh, I, I don't know, I'm not going to speculate too much on that, but. <laughs> It, it, it would make sense that each of them corresponds to a specific area um, and that we see, like, maybe other Gorons or others... Well, I have a theory on the Zora thing. Um, but we have, like, other ones of these species flying around. Uh, it, it, not literally, but some literally. And so, you know, we know that others exist and that these ones are localized, um, which would make sense um, because you don't see certain species out of certain areas. You don't? Um, just in, in, in life. So, um, and it makes sense. Uh, then, one of the other things that the IGN asked Aonuma was, among all the elements, the new elements introduced in Breath of the Wild, which one did you enjoy working on the most in order to make the experience unique? <clears throat> he responded, 
What I prefer in this game is that you have the unprecedented freedom to do whatever you want. This game was designed in such a way that you can climb all the mountains, the main gameplay mechanic consists in climbing mountains, and the world was created so that once you are high above the ground, you can see everything it's made of. If you find an interesting place, you can head there using your paraglider. You will climb, look around, fly again and again. It's a unique method of transportation I haven't seen in any other game, and I think it's really fun and novel. This is my favorite aspect of the game. And I do have to say, having played that game, once you get out of the opening cutscene, out of that uh, uh, the cave, I guess we'll call it, the chamber, um, <laughs> and the cutscene leads you to look off of the cliff, and you see the whole world. And knowing that, like... All of that is a place you can go in the game is pretty Everything cool. Everything the light touches. Yeah. Um, that was a pretty cool moment. And, uh, you know, having the freedom to go wherever you want. Like, um, in... Like, there was... I'll, I'll probably refer to uh, Ocarina of Time for a lot of this. Is that you technically could go wherever you want, but you couldn't really do anything. Like, there was really nothing to do unless you were doing the main story. Um, so the only thing that you could really kind of do out of order was the Shadow Temple and the Water Temple, um, kind of, but, you know, it's, it's, a it's a, it's a difficult, difficult kind of thing to try to compare the two, um, but in Breath of the Wild, you can literally go wherever you want right from the bat. You don't have to go, like, you have to pass by the old man and... I don't even think you have to talk to him, no. but you can, and then you can keep running. You can go straight to the to Ganon's castle. You can talk to him, figure out where you need to go. Um, it, there's, it's just a lot of possibilities. You have the freedom to do whatever you want in this game, um, within the limitations of the mm -hmm. game. And I, I'm glad that he enjoyed doing that because hopefully that means we'll have more stuff like this. We'll have more like op actual open world Zelda games where we can do dungeons whichever order we want although i do think that when there's a specific story in place the dungeons may not be out of order but we're not 100 percent sure on that one um because even in games like uh skyrim and uh witcher fallout there are certain story missions that you have to do in order but the rest of the stuff you don't have to uh, so we we might see something like that i don't know um, but that's what he said his favorite part about developing the game was. So that's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. um, and then, here's here's where it gets where it gets meaty, Nate. Uh -oh. So, Famitsu released some scans, or some scans leaked. Um, and we learned that the bird, uh, Falco, is actually a Rito. Um, which is the same species that was in Wind Waker, the bird people. Um, and I think... That if we look and you kind of like consider things, they're a more evolved version of the Rito. Um, because they've got more feathers, they, they look less human, more bird. Um, and I've got my own theories on that. Um, but what, what kind of struck you when you saw this, Nate? Um, my initial reaction is, I think I know where the game goes in the timeline. But it's really weird... You know, now that I've, I've kind of sat on that thought for, like, all day when I saw it this morning, um, mm -hmm. it's weird that my mind went to, I think I know where this goes in the timeline, when the big controversy is that Rito's, according to Hyrule Historia, evolved from Zora. So there are Zora and Rito mm -hmm. in this game. Well, there is a Zora that we know of in this game. No, there's multiple. Okay. There is, there's the, the red one that we, that we know uh, there's also an art released of a different one, and then there's possibly King Zora in the background of the one shot. Okay. And then there's also another like weirdly shaped Zora in the background as well. Yeah. So th th there's at least like three or four that we've seen. I assume there's more. Mm -hmm. I, we, we don't know. Um, you know, just like we've only seen one Goron, but you assume there's more. Uh, we've seen at least two bird people, mm -hmm. two Rito. Uh, so either way, even if there was only <clears throat> one Zora for some reason. Well, evolution doesn't really work where you have fully evolved Rito <laughs> and then there's still the original evolution around mm -hmm. in any capacity. That's just not how we've evolved. Now, it's a video game, so it could the explanation could just be, yeah, video games. Because <laughs> um, that's the way a lot of things get explained away in video games. Hey, we're a video game. We can do what we want. Yep. We don't have to work by your laws. Uh, but 
the the reason that I, I think the reason that this more than other things in the game like there's Koroks and there's also like the Twilight Princess Castle Town that's in ruins, but the Ocarina of Time one's also in ruins, and uh, you know all the various references to different games like you get off, you know you, when you do that initial shot you just talked about, it's reminiscent of official art from Zelda One, mm -hmm. so like there's all these references to all these different games, and as soon as the Rito was confirmed that that is the race they are. It was like, there's only one thing in my mind that makes sense. And that's that the timeline converges. <clears throat> because Zoras no longer exist in one of the timelines. And that's the timeline that the Rito exists. So, for, for the people that haven't read uh, about it or haven't watched the video, explain what a dragon break is in layman's terms. Because that's what that, that you're talking about in the timeline convergence. So, a dragon break is... I don't want to make this simple, because like <laughs> Daniel, who did, who created the video, he made probably the best explanation of a dragon break I've even seen on the internet. Um, mm -hmm. Like if you look up dragon break on Google, it's you're gonna get confused. Um, <laughs> essentially, it means that there's a whole bunch of choices you can make that lead to all these different endings, but at the end of the day, everything kind of converges into uh, a, a solitary point. So. Even though every single different game in Elder Scrolls, as an example, has multiple endings and have all these different different ways that things can go based on the decisions you made and the way you played the game, uh, Dragon Break exists because when the next game comes out, all of those things, no matter how it ended, still lead to the same next part. So the same next game. Um, mm -hmm. The same beginning. So it, in some way, people hate Dragon Breaks because it, it devalues all the choices you made. Uh, this is why Mass Effect does not work on a Dragon Break thing. You're, well, it tried to uh, with you know they, they patched and added multiple endings in, but the original Mass Effect Three with the original ending um, kind of pulled the Dragon Break because it made us so nothing mattered what you did. Everything ends the same way. Uh, the difference with Dragon Break is it ends in order to lead somewhere, um, mm -hmm. and Zelda's never really had that. It's been a bunch of stuff happens here, split timelines. Uh, none of the games really have multiple endings beyond. Ocarina of Time, which you could argue doesn't really have a multiple ending because it ends the exact same way every single time you play. Um, except for some reason, when you die in this game, unlike other games, it's another timeline. Uh, <laughs> I, whatever, that could be explained in any game, so I, whatever. Just convenience sake. But it, it's almost like, since they released Hyrule Historia, or maybe because of Hyrule Historia, uh, I, I think they looked at it as the timeline has gotten too complicated. Mm -hmm. And there's too much stuff to consider when they make games. So an easy way to wipe the slate clean without getting rid of the timeline, because that's obviously, you know, you could just retcon everything and start all over again, which I think they want to avoid because mm -hmm. a lot of people will just get mad about that because they've spent mm -hmm. 30 years debating the timeline. <laughs> um, is they do a Dragon Break situation where you have all these endings and three different timelines, but it still converges into this single point and that, that single point, in this case, would be Breath of the Wild. So all these things that happen, somehow, the game has to explain it, but somehow comes together to form a single point again moving forward. Um, and I don't know how they could do it. I mean, there's so much time manipulation in Zelda that I can't rule it out. Um, and it's something I personally want. So there's a lot of, like, I see this because I personally want it to be a thing. Um, mm hmm but it's also one of those that, like, Rito exist where Zoras don't. Zoras exist where Rito don't. They can't be in the same timeline. Like, it just doesn't work. Mm -hmm. uh, so if they if those are coming from different timelines, and we have references calling back to the Decline timeline with all the references back to the original Zelda game, it's like, <coughs> it kind of feels like they have references from all three timelines. Everything's obviously coming back together, and this is just what things are going to be moving forward. Wiping the site clean, Breath of the Wild is a new starting point, and every game takes place after it. Um, so, there is another option there for is. the Zora. There is. Um, and that's that it takes place in the past, and that's where we see the Zora. Yeah. Um, and that's the thing. That, we don't know. Mm -hmm. um, because, like, the Zora, you know, you know, like, the one has a blue thing, so it's supposed to be an important companion character. So, it's like, in the past? Can we play parts of the past? Uh, mm -hmm. Like, there's so much we don't know. So, like, it could be part of the past... I've seen some people say, you know, maybe, like I, like I said, that's what I want. And I've been sitting here ruminating all day, and it's like, well, maybe, uh, maybe, like, the evolutionary thing happened and created the Rito, but somewhere 
like King Zora and a few other Zoras just got kind of locked away in a time capsule like Link did for 100 years. Mm -hmm. um, so, like, there's other ways to explain where, like, if this is on the, what is that, the adult timeline, uh, because of the Koroks and all that other stuff that happened, uh, that somehow, some way, just like Link was sealed for 100 years, they ended up getting sealed and didn't, get, and didn't evolve. Um, so, like, there mm -hmm. are other explanations for this. It just feels like those explanations are almost more complex than the alternative. And Nintendo <coughs> obviously likes leaving plot okay. holes. So even if even if they say, yeah, this is where all three timelines converge back together, like they officially confirm it after the game comes out, because they they keep saying they're not going to say it now. Like, when you play the game, it'll become obvious where the game goes. And if that's where it becomes obvious, yeah, um, it'll be very interesting if they leave that giant plot hole of, well, how did this happen? Uh, mm -hmm. why is there, like, you know, and maybe that's, maybe that's the whole explanation behind Calamity Gaddon, for all we know. Um, because... Well, and one of the things to think about, too, is the evolution of the Zora in Wind Waker do doesn't make sense. Or at all. Um, it's a huge Because bubble. evolution, the, the, the whole theory behind evolution is that you adapt to survive, and the Zora live in the water, and the world in Wind Waker is like... 98 percent water yeah so why would they evolve into to yeah. birds yeah it, make, it makes literally no sense but <clears throat> again nintendo explains it away with video games um so yeah. it's like that's it nintendo's used this, that explanation before i think what would it become even more interesting and would even support this further because that's one instance of um something that just doesn't feel like it can coexist is if suddenly we find a kokiri are in this game while the koroks are also in the game that's mm -hmm. another thing, because that's what the Kokiri became. Um, and we haven't seen that yet. We have no idea. Uh, and we've so far, we've only seen uh, Kokiri around the Great, Great Deku Tree. So I don't... I mean, I'm sorry, Kokiri. Uh, Koroks. So I don't think Kokiri are in the game. But it's just mm -hmm. one of those... It, it feels like everything, to me, at least, is pointing towards that being the case. And uh, I, I think something to consider that's not necessarily part of the game, like the game's not telling me this... Uh, I think this is more from the developer side. Uh, they said they want to redefine Zelda. And to me, it's hard to redefine what Zelda is if you're not creating a launching pad for the rest of the series moving forward. And if that only affects one timeline, that means the other timelines could go back to the way Zelda used to be, which I'm sure would make some people happy. Um, yeah, but it would also mean that okay, then this isn't really redefining Zelda. This is just redefining it in one timeline. Um, so yeah, we we like we haven't had a game since Ocarina of Time, and the, that like kind of redefined what Zelda is. And Ocarina of Time is also the game that created the three timelines. <clears throat> so like, if this is the not the new game that redefines Zelda, to me, it has to be a big enough event. Um, like Ocarina of Time was that created the three splits and a huge event that brings all the splits back together, that would definitely be like a key point in history, as they said this is. This is a key point in Zelda history. Um, that's a pretty big, dang key point. Because uh, like you have timelines where Ganon's dead. Uh, like in the adult timeline after the Wind Waker, he doesn't exist anymore. He's mm -hmm. done. So it's like... Uh, you know, so you can even argue, okay, so then obviously Ganon, and, the, and he's called Calamity Ganon. Well, he's only called Ganon in the Downfall timeline. So it's like mm -hmm. all these different references from all the timelines. Uh, Wolf Link, you could bring in. Who knows if that has any significance? Um, mm. You know, on, <clears throat> and maybe we find out in the game, you can call upon your ancestors. And that's, you know, the Wolf Link's a direct one, but maybe we find out that's not it. Wouldn't it like, be cool more... if you could find, like, you know, in in the desert, there was the mirror of twilight, and oh, you could man. you could enter the the twilight realm, or you could see Midna. Like, it it, it opens up a lot of possibilities when you start introducing yeah. a lot of characters like this. Um, for some reason, whenever I think about like them tying all the worlds together, I think about it kind of like in I know that this this isn't what it is, but kind of like in Hyrule Warriors, <laughs> where you see like all the different worlds, um, kind of like converging, um, mm -hmm. <clears throat> but. One of the other things to consider, too, is that most of the time when it comes to time travel or anything dealing with multiple timelines, there's a crap ton of plot holes. 
Um, oh, yes. Like, like, there's no... If this is a convergence, they're not going to pull it off without plot holes. Yeah. Like, some things They're still, not smart enough. Some, th- some, th- <laughs> some things still aren't going to make sense. Like, if you watch The Flash or Legends of Tomorrow, like, they try oh. to explain a lot of the time, like, ab- aberrations or whatever, and they do to a point, but some of the stuff really doesn't make sense. Like, in the newest yeah. season of Legends of Tomorrow, a character that's vital to Arrow gets pulled out of the timeline and doesn't exist in time anymore, but all the events that he caused still happen. So that's a huge plot hole that doesn't make any sense. So a lot of these, like, whenever you deal with time travel, there's there's inevitably going to be some sort of plot hole somewhere um, where some things don't make sense or they don't delve too much into time travel to where they have to explain stuff um kind of mm-hmm. like in the first back to the future movie like there wasn't a lot to explain away because they didn't deal with it a whole bunch um but that being said there are still plot holes and there are going to be plot holes because time travel isn't a real thing that we know of unless you're a conspiracy theorist um mm-hmm. and we don't it's not a definitive science that you can explain right now so you know, we're, we're always going to have these plot holes. We're always going to have some things that make sense, some things that don't. I really hope they try to explain some of this stuff at least, like why they're Rito <laughs> and why they're Azora um, mm-hmm. and why they evolved, why some didn't or some did. I, I don't know. It's it's going to be confusing. It's going to hopefully be explained um, when the game comes out. And I guess we'll see from there. Like I saw, when I, I noticed that it was a Rito... I was a little, I also was confused because I was like, okay, well, how can there be two of these races at the yeah. same time? Um, yeah. un- unless said, it's like, there's these... multiple ways to explain it. It's just, yeah. Oh. Each one gets more difficult as you try to explain it. Yeah. And that's uh, the thing, like, he's like, give the simple rundown of a dragon break. There is no simple way to explain <laughs> it. It's just, no matter what you did, it, because the way to explain it makes it sound bad. It means no matter what you did, it doesn't matter. Because it all leads to the same thing. Well, it's kind of like um, the theory of time is that time wants to happen. Um, so, uh, I, I, this was explained to me a long time ago. So, if, like, someone went back in time and killed Hitler, that uh, the Holocaust was such a big event, such a big ripple in time, that it would ha- that it happens inevitably. Um, yeah, that something like someone... that would happen, regardless of who it was. Because it has such a huge impact on the timeline. Um, and so it might be like that. Like uh, I read an article about a Dragon Break 2. Is that time is willed to happen. And based on the mythology and the Legend of Zelda. With the goddess of time. Who controls time. Time is, is willed into existence. And it's, it's created and guided. And being forced to happen a certain way. And if you're. You know. I'm not going to get too deep into this but if you're a christian and you're a calvinist then you believe that certain events are preordained and that no matter what you do you cannot get away from those events that's that's like five point calvinism that's really deep into it but um there are that that's a very prevalent theory in time is that some events are going to happen no matter what you do um which fits in with the dragon break is that no matter what you end up doing no matter what you know side branches you you try to take it's all going to converge at some point into a decision that's that's going to happen no matter what you do. Um, which, like you said, it's frustrating. It's like, okay, well, we spent all this time making all these decisions for the game to end this way. Um, and that's why you don't find a lot of canonical uh, endings to choice-based games. Mm-hmm. Because it's really difficult. And whenever there is one, it's typically taking into account certain choices. Like an infamous... Um, Infamous 1 and 2 get away with it because the game kind of changes based on your actions. But mm-hmm. Second Son goes under the supposition that you chose a certain ending. Sure. And that's that's one of the things that um, some developers will do, some some movie makers will do uh, based on that. But there's, again, we don't know. It's complicated. Which sucks. Well, yeah, it sucks, but it's also awesome if you're someone who likes yeah. theories. Because... <laughs> Uh, theories are a prevalent thing with everything. Uh, like the theories going around Game of Thrones right now because the book is not out and no one knows what happens next. Um, Mm -hmm. it's crazy. And those theories exist because of things we don't know. And if this does converge everything and there's all these plot holes from it, theories are going to be there to try to explain it. And, Mm -hmm. 
if I there's if there's nothing else I've learned from the Zelda community over my 18 years in it, it's that they love this stuff. <laughs> um, they almost live for plot holes. They want the plot holes to exist. Um, <laughs> and Nintendo themselves hasn't traditionally been very good at telling a story. Uh, which is part of the reason there's plot holes even in individual games where plot holes don't really need to exist. But they kinda like the song of Storm's Paradox. Yeah. Like Yeah. Like the plot hole doesn't need to exist, but it does. And it's something Nintendo probably did not even think about. Um mm-hmm. and if they had better writers or uh people who uh looked at things uh on a whole better, maybe this kind of stuff would be prevented. But you know, reality is that that's just not how games are made. Um, so well, it's kind of like they they dug, they they made their bed. Now they have to lay in it. They have to explain away all the yeah. stuff that they've it, it, yeah. And, and that's that's years. almost why I like the idea of this being a convergence game because even if it mm-hmm. even if it creates a whole bunch of plot holes, it still sets everything up for the future. So like this game is going to have a hard time explaining everything and probably not be able to do it very well. But what happens in this game can set up for everything that happens after it. And that can make sense. Mm-hmm. And I think for a long time, pretty much since Nintendo basically confirmed there's two there's two timelines and then three timelines, is that I think they've needed that reset. That even though this sucks and no one's going to be happy with how we explain it, we need to reset and set things up for mm-hmm. how we want the series to be going forward. Rather than how we've been working off what the series has been. Um, so, yeah. I mean, that doesn't mean... Of course, this is Nintendo, so it doesn't mean they can't ever go back in time and throw a game in there somewhere like Triforce Heroes is not a sequel to Only Between Worlds. Like they can go grab, like make a new game and just throw it in back in the old timelines if they want to do that. Yeah. Um, but the point <laughs> is, is that when they're, you know, and I think they still might do that for like handheld style top down games. Mm-hmm. They might still do that, but for big future console experiences, I have a feeling it's basically here's Breath of the Wild, and everything's gonna be like a straight line off of that. Um, yeah, and that'd be a safe bet. Yeah, I think, and, and especially a safe bet if they're gonna if they if their plan in their minds right now is to never not do open world again in a home console game. Um, <laughs> if like if they're just like, look, we're just going to be open world moving forward because that feels like that's what Zelda is supposed to be. Great. Mm-hmm. Then Breath of the Wild is your starting point, um, and it can't be a starting point. I mean, it can be if you hold it to a single timeline. But then you're going to end up where it's like everything happens in the future in one timeline. It's like the others don't exist. Um, and that creates a whole other problem. Like, where's this empty space of time for all the other all the timelines? Uh, mm-hmm. So that's why I think Convergence actually makes the most sense. Because it, it just it feels right. Um, and everything seems to sound like that's what it is. And none of it seems to make sense. And I think that's the point. And that's, to me, that's the fun of it. Like, that's actually part of what makes this game interesting to me, is even if they can't explain it well, the fact that they even thought in the back of their minds, dude, that's, uh, let's make a game that literally pulls everything from the series together into one game. Because uh, if we stick to the timeline, we can't do that. Mm-hmm. Like, we want Rito and Zora in the same game. Well, we can because, well, yeah, we can. And that's the thing, like... Nintendo can do whatever they want, but clearly they keep saying where it goes in the timeline will be obvious. Where it goes, like, it's part of the timeline, so it's going to have to make sense somehow. Mm-hmm. But yeah, it's just, it's crazy how just getting the, like, I was convinced the whole time it wasn't Rito. Yeah, me too. Because they look even more bird like, so they look like even more advanced than the old Rito were, so they're even more evolved in my mind. And I'm like, it's just got to be a new race, right? Right? Oh, we saw Zora. Okay, so those can't be Rito. Oh, they are Rito. Well, okay. <laughs> mm, well, you either just made things really, really, really complex, or this is what the obvious answer is, mm-hmm. and that's that it converges. Um, but this is Nintendo, so I don't put it past them to just make it super complex, and somehow this falls in a fourth timeline somewhere. Oh, no. Or it splits off a Skyward Sword. <clears throat> this is a Skyward Sword sequel for some reason um i i don't know i'm excited for the the prospect and the idea and i'm one thing i i I gotta give it to nintendo is that um for all we know about this game and all the things we've seen and all the things we've been excited about god we know nothing about the story yeah it it's I, i relate it to like how attack on titan was 
because the more you learned about it, the less you found out that you knew about it. So, like, the more information that came out and the more information that you're bombarded with, you're like, man, I know even less than when I started because all, there's all these mysteries well, yeah. now. <clears throat> yeah, no, and, and even, even, like, the little bit of backstory we learned, mm -hmm. um, it, it's like, yeah, but most of that you can connect, kind of just figure it happened. Mm -hmm. Clearly, Hyrule got ruined by the <laughs> Guardians. Clearly, Link couldn't stop Ganon because he got sealed in the Hyrule Castle, which they would never do if Link could stop him. So it's like, clearly, these events happened. We just didn't know 100% for sure. And now we do. So it's like, oh, so like even that didn't feel like a spoiler to me. It's like, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's a little bit of a spoiler how involved Zelda mm -hmm. was in everything because she hasn't always been that involved. But even then, we still don't know the nature of that relationship and what she did. Um, you know, why she's holding the Master Sword by the Great Deku Tree. Mm -hmm. We can assume, but we don't know. You know, the Sheikah Slate. What was like? What was the purpose of the Sheikah Slate with her? Like, you know, a lot of things we don't know, and, and that's what I like about this is that um, somehow, some way, they built a game that they could show so much for it, yet it's so little. Um, and that's kind of a credit to just what they're doing with this game. It's crazy. Yeah. Um, and I'm surprised nothing... For all, for all we've seen, it's probably still less than 2% of the whole game. I'm just, and it's definitely like 0% of the story. Yeah, I'm just surprised none of the stories leaked. Like, we haven't heard any leaked story details from it. Uh, uh wait, wait a couple weeks. Yeah, I, I'm aware. I, it's that's, just... That's when review copies will land, at least for the Wii U version. Yeah. And, uh, that's when, you know, some media outlet's gonna be that dick and leak something they're not supposed yeah. to. Yeah. But, well, well, we still, I, I'm surprised it hasn't happened yet. We'll put it that way. Um, like, just, there's been leaks of images and stuff, but we haven't had I think, leaks yet. I think some of it has to do with, um, so, like, way back in 2011, uh, we, Zelda Informer, us, uh, thanks to a guy named Alex Plant, who was at E3, found out from a guy on the show floor that works for Nintendo about the, uh, the fact that, the drama between Link, Bruce, Zelda, all this stuff. There's kind of like a high school drama. Mm -hmm. You know, two people like the same person. The girl and the guy. The good guy and the good girl kind of <coughs> like each other. But that good girl's the popular chick. So, like, the Biff Tannen really wants to be with that girl, too. Uh, so, like, we kind of found that out. And that was, like, a big big plot line, big storyline uh, thing. And uh, I think the reason we haven't heard anything like that is because I think so much of the people at Nintendo that aren't involved with localization. Um, like, all the people you're going to see on the show floor, basically, because you're not going to see Treehouse employees yeah. on the show floor. Well, you um, everybody on the show floor is an employee of Nintendo, but they're not involved in the making of the games. Yeah. So, like, <clears throat> I think, like, in the case like Skyward Sword, they probably were, as they were working on it and playtesting and making sure that people were knowledgeable enough to explain things, well, we know that Skyward Sword has, like, a four-hour tutorial or something. <laughs> Um, so, like, they obviously experienced some of that tutorial to be able to tell us that. Um, and they didn't tell us to keep it private, so that's their fault. Otherwise, we wouldn't have said anything. Yeah. Um, but they... So, like, the people on the floor got to know a little bit about the game because they needed to to explain things. Well, you don't need to know the story to explain all the demos in these games. Because mm -hmm. all the demos have been focused on gameplay. Um, and it's crazy because... I don't know if Zelda's been focused on gameplay since Zelda 1, mm -hmm. in terms of, like, this is, like, we don't need to tell you anything. Here's the game. Um, I guess Zelda 2 is a little like that, too, although it, it kind of set things up a bit better. But, so it, it's, it's just, it's very interesting, and I, I'm excited. Yeah. Like, I, I don't think I've been this hyped for a game in a long time. That's a nice transition, too, talking about show floors. Because now we're going to yeah, talk yeah. about our hands-on experience with Zelda. Um, I know that you've talked about it a bunch, but I kind of want to bring it back yes. up again since the hype's kind of building back up and we're about a month away. Um, and I have not played it on Switch. <clears throat> so I'll kind of give a little bit more about my experience. I wrote kind of an, an article about it. didn't kind of write it. I wrote one um, detailing how it felt and, and how it played. Um, so I guess I, the, the thing was I had to wait three hours in line at PAX to play a 20 minute demo of, of Breath of the Wild sure. and about 5 or 6 minutes of that was a cutscene 
what unskippable cutscene, um, stuff we've already seen. <clears throat> and so I knew that, you know, we've seen the, uh, like, okay, we've seen the, the progression of the story where he goes and he's, he built, brings up the tower and then goes to the shrine. So I was like, well, I just want to explore. I want to do some exploring. And so I talked to the old man. Um, there's, there's small things that you can do that, uh, actually, you know, he'll respond to different things you do. Um, like I walked over, I didn't talk to him right away. I was like, Oh, Hey, an apple. And I picked up an apple and he's like, Hey, don't, don't take that. And he's like, I'm, I'm just kidding. Um, which is kind of funny because we haven't really seen a character respond to anything that you do unless you break pots in a house. Mm -hmm. Um, <clears throat> and so he talked and we talked, um, and then I picked up a, a torch behind him and he responded to that too. Said, don't go burning down all the grass, which I didn't do. Um, and so then I took off into a sprint. Okay, and so you have a stamina bar. Um, we've seen that. And everything you do that requires like something like uh, probably a power attack or climbing or swimming, all of that requires stamina. Physical so, exertion. Yeah, anything that exerts Link physically requires stamina. So I took off into a sprint and decided I want to go for a swim. And so I jumped into the water. And as I did, I had the same amount of stamina that I did before I got in the water. So I was in a bit of a tough spot and I drowned. Um, I did that <laughs> twice in the demo because <laughs> I wasn't paying attention to my stamina bar um, <clears throat> because it's not really something that I've ever been cognizant of in a Zelda game um, even in Skyward Sword it really wasn't that big of a deal unless you were doing stuff like there's uh, so the... much swimming in that game <laughs> yeah <laughs> and so uh, so there's stuff like that um, and then I decided I wanted to go fight some of the Bacoblins in a settlement nearby which is in a giant skull um and <clears throat> tried sneaking up at what didn't do a good job um and i tried i fought one at first fought one at the very top of a tower uh knocked him down killed him um used the woodcutter's axe got his bow with no arrows so that made things difficult um and there are different enemies with different levels of intelligence and different strengths and speed uh so that made it difficult because i never like in a Zelda game, that was not something I was used to. No. So I rushed yep. in, and I was like, "Well, I'm going to take all these guys out." And then I got, then I got a game over because this uh, one of the blue bokoblins just like one hit me, um, and I was not paying attention. And that happened twice. <laughs> I got two game overs in my demo because of that single bokoblin. Because I went back, tried to kill, they got the bow again, and I did. Um, and then he came up behind me as I was picking up the bow and killed me. Like they don't wait. Uh, for you to be done with whatever you're doing, they just come up and kill you. Um, like, you know, like natural bad guys. Yeah. And so this, the third time, um, I was like, you know what? I'm just, just going to completely go by these guys. I'm not even going to touch them. Um, <laughs> so then I, I completed the rest of it. Uh, one of the cool things, though, I think this is the coolest thing about the experience, is that the game looked beautiful. Um, we also had headphones um, that were plugged into, like, uh, a system. I think that they were in the TV. I don't think that they were actually in the system. Um, <clears throat> because it was like this, uh, hyper X kind of like what I have set up that was on, like had a volume adjuster that plugged into something behind the screens. And so the, the, the sound was, um, was pretty awesome. I could hear everything around me. I could hear the voice acting, which was a really refreshing thing to hear in a Zelda game. Um, because you hear, at least in the cutscenes, the old man doesn't have a voice that he like talks that we know of yet, unless he's in the cutscenes. Um, but I heard the voice that we can kind of assume is Zelda. Um, I think that's a safe bet. I'm not 100% sure. Mm -hmm. uh, kind of directing. <clears throat> and so then they encouraged me to take it off the screen and play on, on the, the tablet and the little gamepad. Yep. Um, I'm, I'm remiss to, to call it a gamepad because I don't want to get confused with the Wii U Switch. gamepad. Yeah. And so I took the console out and played it with the, the Joy-Cons on the side. And I thought, you know, if, if you've ever held a Wii U gamepad, it feels kind of cheap. Um, all the buttons kind of wiggle. If, yeah. like they're, they're not really fixed. Um, and so they, they feel really plasticky. And like they could, not, like if you really tried, you could pop them out pretty easily. Um, but the Switch is, is pretty thin in terms of uh, how it feels. And the weight's really nice. Like I thought it was going to be really light or like pretty heavy considering that's the console but it's actually felt pretty good in my hands um, and all the buttons were very sturdy 
Um, and I don't really know a better way to explain that other than sturdy because it's kind of like something you have to feel for yourself. <clears throat> because up until that point, I'd been playing with the Pro Controller, which was a, a fantastic controller. Um, if I had like $80 lying around, I'd go buy one. Mm -hmm. um, because it, it, it felt it had a good weight to it. Um, it didn't feel like it was hollow on the inside, sure. which was really nice. Sure. Um, cause probably because it's got all haptic feedback in it and all these other things. Mm -hmm. um, but the Switch itself felt really good. And the screen, the resolution on the screen was amazing. Um, I really, really wish that it would have been easier to record off screen with that because I can't accurately tell you how good it looked um, without you seeing it for yourself. Um, and it, it looked pretty much like I like I just had a, a small TV in my hands. Mm -hmm. um, there was really no like noticeable downgrade in, in terms of video quality. Um, unless you're a really, really big like graphics buff, you're probably not going to be able to tell the difference when you take it down. Um, and so you could play like that for a bit. There was... Uh, <clears throat> all the, the controls were pretty easy to remember and to figure out. Um, and the... The switching between the console and the TV was relatively quick. It took about a, a quick second, um, but I assume that that's just because it's a demo, uh, <coughs> a demo unit. Um, but I got on there, and the controls were exactly the same, exactly as responsive as they were when it was plugged into the TV, which was nice. There wasn't any delay. Nothing was um, like uh, the best. The best way I can compare this is if you ever try to take. Um, Hyrule Warriors on the Wii U off the TV and put it on the gamepad, there's a noticeable shift in quality and frame rate. Um, yes. You don't see that at all. And I guess that's one of the strong suits, too, with the console being in the tablet itself, mm -hmm. is that you're not you're not removing it, you're not streaming it, it's it's all right there. The powerhouse of the console's right there. Mm -hmm. um, and so you, you have everything you need uh, in that controller, and um, it, it feels good. Like it feels natural. It feels like this is what the gamepad should have been. So, um, like everything that it, question it for you. could have had. Um, because I was never really worried yeah. about, uh, I guess, the resolution or because like it, it's 720p. I know mm -hmm. some people will be like, oh, I can still notice 1080 and 720 on that screen. I'm like, okay, whatever. All that really matters in a screen like that is obviously the DPI <clears> levels <throat> and stuff. Stuff that, uh, you know, we're not gonna know what that is until it releases and it gets a full tech, a full tech analysis mm -hmm. by proper equipment. But, um, you know, so a lot of people have said the screen's amazing, and that's awesome. What I want to know, because all the rumors out there about the system is more powerful docked than not docked, is did you notice any frame rate drops in any of the explosions or anything? <clears throat> um, starting the system up, coming out of the, the chamber on the TV, there were two noticeable frame rate drops that I had. Um, I assume that there's, there's two explanations for that. Um, that I could throw three, but I don't like the third one. Um, <laughs> the the first one being that the game was loading as I was moving, um, because this is a giant open world, and you could see everything from where you, you come off of. Uh, that point when it shows the little, like, Zelda Breath of the Wild at the bottom right screen uh, corner. You can probably see the frame rate drops maybe a little bit in my footage, <clears throat> but... They they were like one right after the other, and I think that they it could a um, be because they um, like the game was loading as I was moving because I didn't have any after that. Like those were the only two frame rate uh, drops that I noticed, and then <clears throat> going into uh, I guess the second reason could be that because like I was saying earlier, because it might be a demo unit, so it might be um, just just the the flaw. It might not be the finished product. Um, or the console can't handle it as well. I don't think that's the case. I don't think that the Switch is underpowered in terms of being able to run this Zelda game, so I would not take that away from this. Um, but when I took it onto the, the, the Switch tablet itself, um, there were no noticeable frame rate drops. It ran just as well as it did on the TV. Um, I'd kind of say maybe even better, um, because you're not streaming, um, which is what I kind of consider the dock to do. Um... <clears throat> And it it flowed perfectly uh, in terms of how it played. Um, would I prefer to play it on the big screen the entire time? Probably. Um, mm -hmm. But I'll be able to take this on the go with me and go wherever I want. Um, mostly because I like being able to watch the game on, in, in, on a giant TV screen or on a TV screen in general. 
The um, idea that I but, can, like, play on the TV downstairs, which is broken and sucks. I'm mad, mad mm-hmm. about that. I'm actually upset about that today. Uh, but <laughs> the fact that Yulia, well, like, Yulia, my girlfriend, can be like, okay, you should probably come to bed. And I'll be like, all right, because when we sit in bed, like, we play games on our phone for a couple hours, watch a show. Mm-hmm. on Breath of the Wild one. Like, the, the idea that I don't have to stop, I can just bring the game with, and she mm-hmm. will probably enjoy watching me play it in a way that she probably won't because she's not down here watching me playing on the TV. Yeah. Like, that's just an amazing thing to think about. <clears throat> um, something that I guess I really didn't care because my gamepad couldn't reach the bed before, um, and mm-hmm. I, I just never really considered w- the situations I would use it. Oh, I have to go to the bathroom. Oh, I'm going to be in here for 20 minutes. Oh, <laughs> let me just bring my game with me. Um, it's something that where I think, like you, I'm major. I'm you know, mostly going to play this on, on my TV as a as a docking yeah. system. But I know there's moments of convenience that it's going to be like, man, it's not a big deal for me to just take this with. I don't I don't have mm-hmm. to stop, um, which is important for me as like a family man with three kids and busy all the time that I could just take it with me anywhere. Um, and I already know personally because I don't own a tablet myself. So I already know mm-hmm. that personally, as soon as they launch Netflix on the thing, it's going to be propped up on my desk playing Netflix stuff while I'm working. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's just a personal <laughs> thing. Like I know there's other ways you can do that. Like I have a phone, but my phone doesn't have a kickstand, and I don't want to get out my holder for it. And then, you know, my phone's how I contact everyone, so it interrupts the show. With and So it's mm-hmm. like, yeah, my, you know, it, the kickstand and everything just feels really convenient. But, yeah, I, I'm, I'm excited for the prospect of taking it on the go. I just hope that... <clears throat> You know, you said you didn't notice anything outside of when you first took it off the off the dock for lag, or any frame rate drops. Um, yeah, I, I guess it's gonna experience matters. Like, did did you experience? Like, did you mm-hmm. blow up a ton of barrels in portable mode? Uh, I in the <coughs> on the dock itself, I I rolled the stone. Um, that you saw in the Jimmy yep. Fallon uh, game and then blew up a bunch of the crates. Didn't see a frame rate drop there. Um, I didn't do anything as labor intensive on the the yeah. Switch yeah. console on the console itself, but I imagine, and this is a really weird thing to say, is that it's probably stronger and more powerful when it's undocked than when it's docked. Um, Explain. Well, because you're using none of the none of the system is being diverted when you're hold it, when it's undocked. Um, well, I'll kind of put it this way. So if I have my, my computer plugged into an HDMI cable and it's plugged into the TV, some of the processing power of my computer, um, some of the graphics card is being used to play on the TV, and so it's weaker. So uh, rendering things like video would take double the time um, because it's being broadcast and, and a portion of the system is being used in order to play it on the TV. Um, and I imagine that's a similar thing with a dock. Not that it's going to be like super noticeable, um, but I imagine that it's at its strongest when none of the power is being diverted from the console. Um, <clears throat> and that's not to say that my computer would be inherently weaker on when it's being transmitted from the TV. My old Mac was, but this computer isn't. Um, but that's only because you're using part of the processing power it's not noticeable but if you started to do something really really labor intensive you'd probably notice it um but like i said when i did something with lots of explosions there was no frame rate drop um so i don't think that that's going to be a problem and again like i said if if the whole system if everything you need is in the the portable mode then i don't think you're going to be missing out i think that actually might be the the strongest way to use it because nothing is being um, broadcast, nothing is being streamed. Again, this is all speculation. I don't, yeah. I don't, hundred percent. I was going to say, know. if that's um, the case, the Nintendo's got some voodoo magic going on. Because literally every other <laughs> gaming machine, if you unplug it from direct power, is not as powerful because the battery will just die. Mm-hmm. That's true. Yeah. Like I, like I had a gaming laptop, which obviously wasn't nearly as powerful as, you know, I mean, it, it blew the switch out of the water, but. It, yeah. It's one of those that, like, you unplug it, yeah, I can push it to max. Like, I like it'll default mm-hmm. and, and, and lower clock speeds and lower everything down. But I can put it back up to the normal levels, and the battery will be gone in 30 minutes. Um, yeah. That's, that's the same thing with mine, is that if I'm playing even a basic game like Binding of Isaac on my computer, and it's unplugged, mm-hmm. 
then it's it, it kind of has it chugs along at yeah. some points. And it's, yeah, um, it, it, and a lot of that's because <clears throat> the computer's trying to conserve battery so it lasts longer. Um, mm-hmm. So that's why I found it interesting because like that that's kind of the rumor out there is that it runs better in dock mode not not because you know yeah it might have the extra processing of having to deal with the USB C out into HDMI and we have no idea if any of that processing is handled on the dock or mm-hmm. not because we're not no no one has a dock <laughs> to open it up to see how that's being have how you mm-hmm. know if the dock is doing most of that work or if the system is but. Um, the system, in theory, because it's got direct power, should be running at full blast, whereas on battery, it probably shouldn't, unless you want to kill the battery. Well, and one of the things to consider, too, is that I'm assuming that they had a cord already plugged in, because it was tethered. Sure, well, yeah. They weren't going to yeah. let me walk away with it. Um, so, uh, I assume that it might have already been charging um, while it was there. Um, I'm I'm not a hundred percent sure. No one I can't knows. Really, like confirm anything. We don't have yeah. any pictures of them putting the tethers on, so we don't we don't actually know if yeah. they, that's all they are is just tethers, or if there's a power cable running through directly into the system. It's been modified. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's still like all in all, it still yeah. ran really well. Well, and it sounds like the well, yeah. Mode. The reason I asked you about the explosions is because if you did repeat that on portable, then it's really hard to know because like w- when we looked at the past switch footage. The only time it seemed mm-hmm. to notice frame rate drops was explosions. So it's like, yeah, I don't think on portable mode you'd notice it through normal gameplay. But like, the explosions, which are like some of the most biggest, most intensive things that that is done in this game, um, it's a sh- it's a shame you didn't you didn't find an- another yeah. explosion. Like I was actually thinking as you were talking earlier about like that skull thing. Um, if you uh, so one thing that's really cool is. At least this was true back on the Wii U demo. I don't know now. It's been you know six months since I played. Uh, is that when you pick up the bow from like that that particular bow goblin, uh, you don't mm-hmm. have any arrows. But if he shot arrows at you, you can go pick them up off the ground if mm-hmm. he missed you, and they just stay there like they don't vanish. So what what I, what I did is I picked up one of the arrows, and then if you look through, I think it was the left eye or the right eye. Yeah. You could actually shoot down that thing, and there's a barrel in there, and it'll explode. And, then you don't have to fight those those bokoblins. Yeah. Because those bokoblins are nasty. Mm-hmm. Like, it's really cool. Like, this game is hard. Like, it it might... It, I don't want to say... It's not the hardest Zelda game ever. It's it's but really it's difficult. Very di- it's it's more difficult than I think Zelda games have been... In a long time. In a time. very long time. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's not... Like, to me, it doesn't feel difficult in a frustrating way. Like... It's like, oh, I should have planned better, or yeah. oh, I should have done this differently. Or like, yeah, and there's multiple approaches. Like, you tried stealth, you tried the balls to the wall, I'm just going to charge in approach, uh, <laughs> which didn't work. Uh, or, or maybe it can work, but you got to have a hell of a lot more skill at dodging and et cetera, et cetera. Mm-hmm. Get those flurry attacks going. Um, yeah. But yeah, no, sorry, I just, I, I'm, because, because like, I, I haven't played the Switch. Um, mm-hmm. You know, I'm begging Nintendo to send me a review Switch unit. It's not going to happen. <laughs> I know it's not going to happen, but I'm going to keep trying. Uh, but like, mm-hmm. that's the big thing I want to know. And, and maybe the maybe Breath of the Wild isn't a good showcase since it's it, it feels at, at least based on the footage I've seen, it almost feels like it, it's more of a port than an upgrade per se. Um, yeah. Like yeah, obviously the upgrade resolution 900p, blah blah blah, whatever. But it, it's one of those where I don't know if it's a good showcase on if the power is weaker in handheld mode or not. Um, and the thing is is I don't think we've seen a game yet that's a good showcase for that. <laughs> um, well, I think I think a game, if we saw a game on, like, a third-party game, um, like Skyrim, being played in handheld mode, because that game is significantly more taxing than I imagine most Nintendo games are. Yeah, but see, I also don't um, think that's, that's a good barometer mm-hmm. either, because, like, the remaster is basically new textures, and it's new textures in a five-year-old game. Well, I'm I'm just saying something like that, a third party game, yeah. that is more advanced in terms of how it's built and how yeah. it runs, might be a better indicator. Yeah, um, than a Nintendo built game. I know, and <coughs> it's weird because I, I I'm thinking of the lineup right now. I don't think there's a game like that that even exists for the system. Yeah. From what I can tell, for Mario Kart, it didn't seem like there was any difference between the gamepad um, and the, uh, the Switch portable and and the streaming on the tv yeah um it'll be interesting uh i think 
because Activision is a partner. Yeah. So if the new Call of Duty comes out and it's not like the 360 version, like it's like a downported PS4 version, I think yeah. that might be a good way because that that game's heavily relying on FPS. Like oh, crazy. It's, it's, it's explosions the game. Yeah. Yeah. So like that might be the first time we really get to see. Uh, I mean, obviously people are going to factually figure it out, um, mm-hmm. but like. None of that matters if, if you as a player can't notice it. It doesn't really... Oh, it's down clock. It doesn't really matter if you don't notice it. Um, well, and also at the same time, like, you know, <clears throat> a, a few fame, frame rate drops here and there isn't really a bad thing. Mm-hmm. Um, because it, if unless it's like Assassin's Creed Unity level frame rate drops where you <laughs> notice them throughout the entire game, it's really yeah. not that much of a problem. Like, there are frame rate drops in... A lot of triple A title games. There sure are. Um, and and it's it's because they're they're pushing they're either pushing the console to its limit or it's a poorly uh, used uh, poorly usage of resources <laughs> um, use of resources for for the game. Um, <clears throat> so we'll we'll see. Um, again, like you said, once the game once the console comes out, we'll see. Um, it'd be torn apart in terms of all the specs for it, how it runs, its power, its clocking speed, all that stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, but from what I could tell from other, the games that I watched and um, from how it ran, it looked like it, it ran the Nintendo games that were on it very well. Um, it didn't seem like there were any struggles to run anything. Granted, Nintendo games aren't exactly the most graphically intense games. Uh, so like Splatoon 2 isn't exactly like oh my gosh this thing is balls to the walls crazy with graphics it's it's it handles the first party games well it'll be interesting to see how it handles third party games or better yet how third party companies handle the switch <laughs> <clears throat> yeah so finally played Breath of the Wild mm-hmm. what uh, is there anything in there like obviously you work at Zelda Informer. This is a Zelda Informer podcast. You've uh, pretty much know everything there is to know about the game publicly available. Mm-hmm. Was there anything that surprised you? Um, I don't know if okay. In terms of surprise, really, like the the AI was surprising. I don't think we've seen like that kind of a developed advanced AI in a Zelda game before. Um, but I think it wasn't so much a surprise. Um, as when I heard the voice acting in Zelda for the first time, I realized how much it actually, like, belonged there, um, and how much it, it, like, had a home in a Zelda game, if that makes sense, um, or, like, what, what had been missing up until this point, because, yeah, we've been missing, like, the true open world and stuff, but, uh, it made the game feel more alive um, and more aware and made you feel more aware of what was going on. Um, I got, I, I'm trying to explain it with words, but it's, it's it's something that you have to experience yourself in terms of the voice acting because when I played it and I heard it, I'm like, this this is something that Zelda's been missing for all these years is, is actual voice acting in a game. Um, and in terms of anything else, I mean... <clears throat> a, a living, breathing environment would have been the surprise. Was the surprising thing like seeing how much the the world actually is alive? Like being able to chop down a tree, mm-hmm. um, seeing how characters, or at least the old man, reacts to what you do. Um, different, like small nuances like that. Like the 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 devils in the details with this game because every little thing that they put their heart and soul into is evident and intentional and so it's all that small stuff that you're like wow i i never knew i needed this in a zelda game <laughs> and as much as i'm loath to say this when reggie was like we we want to give you things that you want but also things you didn't know you needed that's kind of what they're doing with breath of the wild is that they're giving us everything we want or at least most of the stuff we want but they're also giving us things that we didn't know we wanted um which is great I mean, so far I haven't seen anything that I don't like about this game. <clears throat> so, I, I mean, uh, we had the question, I think it was last week or the week before, where we talked about whether or not you sh- uh, it's it's worth it to get a Switch for 
this game or, or just to get a Switch in general. Mm -hmm. And after having used it and played it, I'd say that, yes, you should get a Switch if you are financially able to. Mm -hmm. um, just because it, it does feel like the definitive version of Zelda in terms of graphical capabilities, but also being able to hold it and play it uh, on the go is... It's it's amazing because it's like you're holding a small L, like high def TV in your hands, <laughs> which we haven't really had a console that does that that well. That is done that is done well in the market because mm -hmm. the Lord knows that the the game pad for the Wii U was not high def and was not strong in terms of how it handled the graphics. Vita didn't exactly take <clears throat> off. Yeah. So if if you're on the fence about getting a Switch and you want one. But and you have the money and and you really want, but you're not 100 percent sure. I'd say go for it. Um, whether you want to get it at launch is completely up to you. If you think that the launch titles that they've released is or are appealing, if you're like, oh well, you know, I just want Zelda and and you know that's all I see right now. Then if you want to get it on Wii U, go go for it. But I'd say that the the best version that you're going to get of this game is on the Switch, um, and that's just from playing it. Kind of like Nate said last week. <coughs> I wish you guys could all play a demo of this game, mm -hmm. um, whether it's on the Wii U or the Switch, to show you how good of a Zelda game it is, and for all the people that don't like what they're doing, to actually see what they're doing in the game um, and see how amazing yeah. it is. Um, because it, tr it truly is a, a completely different experience, completely different Zelda game than we've ever gotten before. Yeah. And some of you may not like this changes, but they're really good changes. Mm -hmm. And... Mm -hmm. It's like when they first decided to put peanut butter in chocolate. Not a lot of people probably <laughs> liked it, but it was probably one of the best things to happen to humanity. <laughs> yeah, and, and that's because, uh, you know, obviously I, I put up an editorial over at Nintendo Prime about um, why they, why why these changes are, are basically good. Um, mm -hmm. Because I'm coming from the perspective that a lot, basically all the naysayers against these changes are all people that have not played the game. Um and my yep. whole time, all I keep telling people is, I understand your concerns about the no green tunic, the no rupees in the grass, the cooking for your for your health. Like I understand why you have complaints because I had them too. Then I played the game, <laughs> and outside of voice acting, which I really really wanted, I wasn't I was skeptical they could do it well, but I I always wanted that in Zelda because I always felt like that's missing. Mm -hmm that could take their storytelling and their immersion to a new level. Um, which, it feels like we're not entirely there. It might just only be in cutscenes. I want to see it in the whole game. Um, that's obviously not yeah. the case, because the old man doesn't, as, as we know at the beginning. We know the person at the stables doesn't talk. Mm -hmm. So, like, it's clearly not full voice acting in the whole game, but it's a step in that direction. Um, yeah, it, baby and, steps. And, you know, the fact that it's in all cutscenes, like, that's huge. So... I, I sit there and I'm like, you just have to play it because on the surface, you can say, this sounds like a Skyrim light. This sounds like another Witcher game. Here's a list of stuff it does. Here's a list of stuff these games do. It's like those games. Here's a list of stuff <coughs> Zelda does. None of these are checked. It's not a Zelda game. You just have to play it. It, it can't be mm -hmm. explained because it's a feeling. And I think uh, when... EJ Nobu and Miyamoto recently said that this is the essence of Zelda, this game. I think I have a grander appreciation for what Zelda actually is after playing just the demo. Mm -hmm. um, because it's easy to get fooled into the traditions. You know, Zelda is the Master Sword. Zelda is the Triforce. Notice how no one's talked about the Triforce this entire time. Yeah. There's not been one iota even hint at a Triforce in this game. And yes, Calamity Ganon's there. Zelda's there. Link's there. Clearly, there's probably a Triforce connection, but it's not even being talked about. And that's weird, because that's a common thing all Zelda fans know about, but they're not bringing it up. Mm -hmm. um, so it's kind of like, all these classic Zelda elements are kind of going by the wayside, but that's because those aren't what, what make Zelda what it is. And yeah, it's easy, to get, it's easy to get caught up in that. And once you play this game, um, I feel like, I'm hoping that a majority of you naysayers that um, feel like it's changing too much or it's no longer Zelda, will get the feeling I got after playing the game for even just a handful of minutes. It It's like, this not only feels amazing, 
this feels like a Zelda game. This feels mm -hmm. like what Zelda was always meant to be. And it almost feels like all these other things that Zelda used to be almost feel antiquated. Like, okay, cut grass and get rupees. You know how much grass is in this game? <laughs> it just doesn't make sense for that to be how this world works. Mm -hmm. um, but in previous games, grass was mostly a flat texture with patches. So the patches is how they handled the balance of the game by only having so many patches of grass. Well, when the mm -hmm. whole world has grass, that doesn't work anymore. So you got to rethink that entire system. And it's um, going to be weird going back to other Zelda games. It's very too, weird. After playing this. I tried, I tried going back uh, this week. I tried playing some Skyward Sword. Uh, I tried playing... I, I was trying to go in order of like my favorite games. I was trying to play like, eight different Zelda games. Uh, it's weird to say this because it's only a demo, but these games almost feel like they're worse than I thought they were after I played the demo. Because they feel antiquated, they feel old, they feel out of touch with gaming. They feel, well, they feel incomplete. Yes. Kind of, kind of like when you're talking about the grass, like um, <clears throat> having like actual grass. Like but The background for my computer right now is it rotates through screenshots of Breath of the Wild. Yeah. And one of, it, it's showing all the grass and stuff in, in, on the like a field of grass with you know patches and then like patches of dirt. And it looks natural. And it looks like something that you would see in any, like, any real world or any, you know, even fake land. Mm -hmm. As opposed to, like, okay, well, this looks like green green cement and that looks like blue cement. <laughs> but they're actually, like, grass and concrete. They're two different things, but you can't really tell. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> and it's it's going to be those, like, like I said, those small details that you didn't know that you wanted. Mm -hmm. um, and and yeah, it... to focus... You know, go on. Oh, to focus on them as negative um, without experiencing them first is kind of short-sighted mm -hmm. uh, because you you don't know how much they add to the game. Yeah. Um, you don't know what what they actually bring forth in the game. You don't know what um, it having what it feels like <coughs> to play it. Yeah. Because um, I feel like a lot of the conventions that get scrapped for these all these new ideas, these fresh ideas, is that. Until you experience it, it just doesn't make sense. Um, it does sound like other games. But having mm -hmm. played Skyrim, having played The Witcher, having played all these games that this is compared to, this is nothing like well, those I'll games. pose a question to you then. This is it, dis cause, distinct. Because for me, when I played the demo, I didn't think about it feeling like any of those games. So when you played the, the demo multiple times... Did you even think, oh man, this is exactly like Skyrim, or oh man, this is exactly like The Witcher? No. Exactly. No. <clears throat> because it's not. Mm -hmm. Just because there might be a checklist of items that are the same between the games doesn't mean they are executed in remotely the same way for the same reasons. Um, and every time I think back on my experience, go back and watch my videos on it, it's like, this feels like a Zelda game. There was not a moment I played it that I said, man, this, this doesn't feel like Zelda. It was, oh my god, they did it again. <laughs> they they did something I didn't think they could do anymore. They literally pulled an Ocarina of Time out of their ass. I, and the thing is, I don't even think Ocarina of Time is that great, but I know how important it was yeah. for what it did. And they just created something that important again. Um, and the thing is, I think this game is going to resonate... Not just for Zelda. I think it's going to resonate for future open world games and other franchises. Mm -hmm. um, because of the... Like, think about this minute detail. And this is something that a lot of people aren't going to care about. But it's been emphasized so much by E.G. Anoa that clearly the, he's really proud of this. Is that it's all about the little details that a lot of games <coughs> overlook. Um, mm -hmm. Like, the feel of riding a horse. Mm -hmm. um, I admit, in a lot of games, riding a horse does not feel good. No. It feels awkward. It really doesn't. It, it, it doesn't feel natural. It doesn't feel like it belongs. Um, and I haven't ri ri ridden a horse yet, so I don't know exactly. I've only seen what it looks like on screen, and what it looks like and what it feels like when you're playing it are two different things. Because mm -hmm. um, you can have the best animations in the world, but it can still feel clunky. It can still feel unnatural. Which, again, you're holding the controller, trying to get the feel of horseback riding. <laughs> it's understandable why that's, why that's hard to do. But, like, he emphasizes things like individual individual sounds of the hoofs hitting the ground. Mm -hmm. and hitting the grass and how it sounds different and how much attention was paid to just that aspect of making sure 
you can feel those horse feet hit the ground and that the sound it makes is the sound it's supposed to make. Mm -hmm. And I'd be even interested if it makes a different sound when it's raining out and the grass is wet. Um, That'd be interesting. Like, and the thing is, they put that kind of fine detail into the sound of a horse hoof. What kind of, like, fine details did they put into everything else? Mm -hmm. Um, Because the one thing I took away, and this was way back at E3, and it's probably the same now, is that this demo is one of the most polished demos I've played in my entire life. I gotta agree with that one. That's Um, true. And I said this back there in E3, and I know it sounds crazy, but, I mean, and I got to spend a lot more time with it than you did. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I got to explore a lot more and experience a lot more of the Great Plateau. But, like, I even said at the time, if they had just released this demo as a standalone $40 game, I would buy it. That's how good it was. That's how good it felt, and that's how much stuff there was to do. Um, and that's just the Great Plateau. Yeah. <clears throat> like, that's crazy to me that that's how amazing uh, that it was. So, yeah, I... You know, it... Oh, this game, man. Well, and one of the things to keep in mind, too, is that when people keep comparing it to other games and saying, well, you know, it has this, so it's trying to copy Skyrim, that that's that's a, a, an awful argument. Because there are certain tropes and certain mechanics that exist across the board in different games and in different films. That's like saying <coughs> um, that uh, Captain America Civil War is exactly the same thing as Batman v Superman. Um, just because they have two heroes fighting each other. Like, mm-hmm. just because of a small detail or, or a specific detail doesn't mean that they're the exact same thing or that they're copying each other. Um, these are these are tropes. These are mechanics that you see over and over again. That's like co- comparing any turn-based RPG saying, oh, yeah, well, po- it's just the same as Pokemon. It's like, well, no, it's using a battle system similar to it, but it's not the same thing. It's like you can't call Final Fantasy a Pokemon clone. Mm-hmm. It, it, that, that, that doesn't match up. Yeah. And so taking small details and... and, and other things to implement that that work that's the thing too is that because these things work in other games then they work in zelda why not have them you know sure. why why not have breakable items because that that lets you or have items with different power levels so as you progress through the game since you're not leveling up your power is shown more through the items that you have and how powerful they get um mm-hmm. so like you start out with a stick and then the next dungeon like major dungeon, you've got like a, a steel sword that does like three, four times the damage that something else does, and that shows progress. <laughs> but that also shows that you know this is something that worked in other games, and it's working here too. So why not implement it? And it's not saying that they're copying it, but that they're mm-hmm. like this works in the world that we're building. Like this makes sense. <clears throat> and so again, a lot of the things that you'll find in this game make sense in in a living, breathing world. Uh, like the, like they talked about with the NPCs is that the NPCs are they all have their own personalities they all have their own schedules it's like that makes sense in a living breathing world that's supposed to feel natural mm-hmm. um, and so to discount these changes because they sound like other things and sorry I'm going really Italian right now because I'm speaking with my hands but to discount the changes because they sound like things from other games is, I think it's it's a foolish argument and it doesn't work because just mm-hmm. because it's take it has similar mechanics doesn't mean they're the same thing um, I mean, you could you could say PlayStation All Stars Battle Royale is the same thing as Smash Bros. You'd be right because it's basically a, a, a Sony clone, <laughs> um, but you can't really say that this is a clone of Skyrim um, mm-hmm. or or a Zelda skin on Skyrim. Like uh, that's that's not how this works. And it's, once you play the game, you'll find that that's not true either. Yeah, like, and I'm sure there's gonna be people who don't like it because that's just the way they are, and that's fine. Yeah, you can't please everyone. I mean, and the thing is, like, some people aren't into open world games. Uh, Mm And so, like, this isn't going to make you like open world games. Um, You know, what makes this so great isn't going to uh, make up for it. So it's kind of one of those, you can't appease everyone. All they can do is appease as much of the fan base as they can. And based on the pure viewership that these trailers (laughs) are getting on YouTube, um, the amount of traffic, record-breaking traffic, that is coming to Zelda Informer every time we have big news about Breath of the Wild. This is like the most hyped I think people have been for Zelda since that 2004 reveal trailer for Twilight Princess. Mm-hmm. Um, and this might even overall top that. And we'll see. Sales will, sales will show if it actually does top that. 
Um, yeah. But, <clears throat> man. Like, this is the reason you can't buy a Switch, by the way. Yeah, it's not because of 1-2 Switch. That's I mean, not the reason. I mean, I want to play 1-2 Switch, but yeah. that's that. That's not why that system <laughs> sold out. It's because people try this game and no one has... Put it this way, I have yet to see someone play the game and say anything negative overall about their mm-hmm. experience with the game. Um, you'll yeah. get some fine, detailed nitpicking, but that's where it ends. Yeah. Um, th- otherwise, they overall think it's fantastic. So it's like, if every person who plays it just thinks it's amazing, there's something to that. So just, if you're skeptical... Yeah. Um, I'm not saying buy it and spend three hundred dollars on a switch and um, to find out, but play it at a friend's house, borrow it, rent it off GameFly for your Wii U. Um, yeah, so that's about to like. Say. There's multiple ways to try this game <clears throat> out without spending a bunch of money and see if you agree with our assessment. And great, we're just talking about the beginning area. Like we can't imagine how much how much more amazing the the whole world is beyond that plateau. Mm-hmm. Um, because that's the only thing I was worried about, and it's still a concern of mine, is that so much attention was paid to the Great Plateau that the rest of the world doesn't live up to the Great Plateau. Um, yeah. And that's still a valid concern because we still haven't seen a lot of the game. But mm-hmm. I, the more they talk about <laughs> it, the more they show, uh, the more I am gaining faith that the Great Plateau is not like a great setup for something that never happens. It is mm-hmm. what to expect from this world yep. so and my video cut out as always something always happens well yep i mean we're close yeah, to the end yeah. anyways i figured so <clears throat> there's not really much else that we could talk about um in terms of that because uh we pretty much talked that to death so basically the only way that you're gonna if for all the naysayers if you don't think that this game's for you give it a shot anyways yep. somehow like whether Nintendo releases a demo for it, or if you have to rent it, or if you have to borrow it, like, don't don't discount it just yet because I think this game will surprise you in ways that you weren't expecting. I definitely agree. <clears throat> so that's where we're gonna cut it off uh, tonight. Keep in mind too, not Zelda related. I'm just throwing this at the end. Tomorrow, Fire Emblem Heroes comes out, um, so be ready for that. Uh, enjoy it. Well, yesterday it came out because yep. you'll be hearing this on a Friday. But tomorrow, because we're recording on a Wednesday, it's time travel. Don't worry about it. But yeah, Pothole. so that's it for this Pothole. week. <laughs> All right. Yep. See you guys next See you, week. Man. Bye.